Good morning. Good morning. Are we ready this morning? Yes. Y'all ready today? Yes. Come on. Last week we left ready, you remember? We were we were on fire. Are we still on fire for Jesus this morning? Let's go. All right, just check it. Let's go. Last week we dropped in on the disciples in the days right after Jesus' resurrection, and they were waiting on the arrival of power from the Holy Spirit. And for the last couple of weeks, maybe some of you are a little more sensitive to the Spirit's work and have been noticing longer. We have been experiencing God moving mightily in our midst to the extent that, as Chevy was pointing out, some things you can see it and you can feel it and sense it uh, in the sense that we find ourselves in the midst of a little, if I can say it, Holy Ghost party. Can, you, can say you can say it. Can Christians party? A, a little Holy Ghost party? Okay. I don't be over the top, but I don't want to deny the movement of God or withhold any of the glory that he's done for his work either. Amen? Amen. Amen. Right now, there are some amazing things happening, and we would be wrong to miss them. Now, you know the thing about a Holy Ghost party? Do you know the thing about a Holy Ghost party? There ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because a Holy Ghost party don't stop. I know, right? You're like, no, please, really, stop. <laughs> Not the Holy Spirit, just you. <laughs> you stop. Nah, I don't have fun, I'll stop. <laughs> just so long as you don't stifle or quench or grieve the Holy Spirit of God who is moving in our midst. We good? Amen? Amen. 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 So Christ had told his followers he was sending them the Holy Spirit who would fill them with power. And I want to talk more about the Holy Spirit and to help us better understand this power. The power that God has given to us, we who walk with Christ and believe. So if you would, we're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Look with me if you would at Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, in the matchless, inspired, and inerrant word of God. Where verse 15 of Ephesians 1, the Apostle Paul, he prays for the church. He says, for this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I don't cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the Spirit, capital S, Spirit. There he is referring to the Holy Spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The church, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. And this is the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. So what we just read is the first of two prayers that the Apostle Paul writes in this letter to Christians in his letter to the Ephesians. And in this prayer, Paul, he prays that his readers will be given wisdom from the Holy Spirit so that we might know, that we might be enlightened to know, that the eyes of our heart might be open to see the wisdom and the hope and the power that is ours in Christ. And that's my prayer. I want us to see. I want us to see the work of God. I want us to know. I want us to know the hope and the power that he's given to us in Christ. I don't want us to be a people that's merely been saved. We've got to be a people at a minimum that have been saved. I don't want us to be a people that merely believes. And then we say, okay, you know, that's, that's all God wants for me. And that's all God wants from me. That's good enough. That's all I need. And then beyond that, we don't live into the power of God, but we just limp our way through this world just trying to survive. When God has granted us his power, 
I want us to know and live in the hope and the riches and immeasurable greatness of his power toward us, who Paul prays, have the eyes of our hearts open to see. Uh, this prayer, uh, this is one amongst a handful of prayers that Paul writes in Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians, which are known as his prison prayers. Because they are written during his imprisonment. And Paul, he is in prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so you'd think then, that being the case, maybe he might be resentful because preaching Jesus has put him in prison. Or that he might be doubtful, doubtful of God's goodness for allowing him to end up in this situation. Or that he might be skeptical of the power of God that we keep hearing about and that he keeps talking about. But it's interesting. In none of these prayers does Paul pray for material things. Not once. Paul doesn't ask for earthly blessings. He doesn't ask for a change in circumstance. In none of these prayers does he pray for his release from physical bondage in prison. But he prays for a change in us. He prays for Christians. That our spiritual perception and our Christian character would be developed and would be strengthened. As Paul says a little further up in verse 3, he says, God has already blessed believers with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And he doesn't pray that God will provide any further resources, but that God will give us the ability to see and to behold all that it is that we already have in Christ. Amen? He's praying that God will grant revelation to us by the Spirit to see and to know and to understand what God has done and what God is already doing. And what power he has given to us to do all that he calls us to do. To understand and to recognize and to see the work of God in their midst. In our midst. And that we would behold the story of what God's doing. And that we would then be emboldened. And Paul's writing to Christians to tell us not to be discouraged by what the eyes of our flesh see. In the case of these Ephesians here. They look around, they see our Lord and Savior has been crucified. The disciples are being martyred. Their leader who planted this church, Paul, he's in prison. And Christians are being persecuted. But Paul writes elsewhere to Christians, he explains, I want you to know, brothers, sisters, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He says, all of this is happening according to God's plan. And I want you to have eyes of faith to be able to see our enemies and our persecutions and the challenges and the setbacks that we come across and to not be discouraged, but to recognize them for what they are, to recognize God is in control, that these things must happen and all things are working according to his purpose. I want you to trust in the power of God in you and I want you to live in power. And here, Paul, he's taken the saving work of Jesus Christ to Ephesus. He's taken the saving work of Christ to the nations. Of these people, they're coming to faith in their lives. They're being changed. And that work and the church there at Ephesus and the, the Christians in that church, like Christians historically, have been in so many places. They face a lot of opposition. A lot of resistance. Because the work that God does, it stirs resistance. And understand, not just out there, it stirs resistance that begins first within our own hearts, within our broken sin nature in here. Our flesh wars against the things of God. We do not readily accept the things of God. It's a wrestle. God's work, it stirs resistance in the world. We know the resistance presence present out in the culture out there. We know the things of God and the people of God face opposition. That opposition is present in the spiritual realm. There are spiritual forces at work constantly trying to create confusion and doubt intent on stealing your hope. Trying to create confusion and doubt that stifles your progress, that robs your joy, that diminishes your trust in the work that God has started in you. Aimed at making you doubt, making you doubt God, doubt yourself, doubt the goodness of the truth that has healed you. Doubt whether or not you should go and share that truth with the world? 
forces that are aimed at driving you to give up on all that God has said. And you simply cannot expect God's work, His work in the world, His work in you, your involvement in His work, and His using you. You cannot expect God's work to never face resistance. Trust me. I know. You guys know. But there is nothing larger and more important in all creation than the saving work of God in Christ. That work that delivers people from the clutches of Satan, slavery to sin, and that turns people back to God. The saving work that he's doing in and through you. And there are forces in this fallen world that are vehemently opposed to it. In a world that the moment you walk out that door is going to bombard you with endless messages of hopelessness. That's going to tell you marriage doesn't work. You can't raise disciplined kids. Families aren't meant to stick together. Just give up. You can't conquer your sin. You can't control your anger. You can't overcome your anxiety or your depression. You can't beat addiction. These are lies from the pit of hell. Amen. Maybe telling you, you're too old. Your usefulness is past. Everybody's passed you by. You're too old for God to care. He's forgotten about you. His church and his people, maybe even your own family, they don't call you. They don't have use for you or need of you. Lies. This church stuff, they'll tell you, this church stuff is all a bunch of lies and hooey and superstition anyway. Your friends and your family, they're never going to accept this. This is just going to drive distance between you. And the people around you, they're never going to be saved. They're never going to believe. They're never going to change. It's lies. In a world that the moment you walk out that door, is going to bombard you with endless messages of naturalism. They take your blessings and say, that's not the work of God. That's just coincidence or luck, or that's not the work of God. That comes from skill and by the sweat of your own brow. It's going to bombard you with secularism and progressivism. It's going to tell you this book and its historic interpretation, the historic Christian faith, it is regressive. It's backwards. It's hateful. It's hurtful. And it's keeping us from progress. It's going to try to tear down your hope and your faith. And it's going to try to convince you that it's foolishness. To convince you that Christianity is foolishness and it's dying and it is done. I'm just going to stop right here and interject. Yeah, not today. Yeah. Just last week I read a uh, cover article from CNN that said they now think that the death and demise of Christianity has been greatly overstated because they're seeing an, an upturn in Christianity. Which is a funny thing because that's what I believe until CNN said. No, I'm just kidding. I still believe it. <laughs> But all this, trying to drive you to concede defeat, to just give up, until you slowly, you stop numbering your blessings, you slowly stop seeing with the eyes of faith, open to see the wisdom and power and hope of God in Jesus Christ. No, we need the spirit of truth. We need the spirit of wisdom. We need the spirit of hope. We need the spirit of power. And we need the spirit of revelation. Paul says. We need to have eyes open to see. We need to be reminded constantly of what God has done, what He is doing, and where He is taking us. Amen? Amen? We need to behold and recount the work of God in and through and around us. And we need to celebrate and not look lightly on and not let it pass by and be quickly forgotten all that God is doing in our midst right now. Amen. God's moving here. The same God that moved in the ancient world that moved at the empty tomb, that moved at Ephesus, that moved Christians across the Atlantic Ocean to the Americas, that moved in all the historic revivals of the past, that moved in the American Great Awakenings, is moving in and around and through you. He is working revival in you. And the Christians, they're in Ephesus. Paul's writing because they need to be reminded again of the power of God in them. 
The power of the God who had worked great miracles in their midst, they still didn't fully comprehend the power of the God who saved them, the same God who raised Christ from the dead. And they failed to grasp the power of God that they had in their being united together in Christ by His Holy Spirit. There is power in us being united together in the body of Christ. It's not that these people weren't saved. They weren't. It's not that they didn't have the Holy Spirit. These are believers. This is the church. They were faithful, but they didn't fully get it. They didn't fully get how powerful they really were. The flame in their hearts, it was smoldering, but it wasn't burning like it should in the knowledge and wisdom and hope of the power of God. And that's why Paul is praying this prayer to point the church's eyes squarely on God and to say, don't forget who's in control. Don't forget the power of God. Don't forget the Spirit of Christ who is alive and at work within you. Well, the Ephesian Christians, they had just been turned down low. And Paul, he's writing here, he's saying to them, the time for wallowing and worry, it's over. The time for discouragement and living defeated is buried with Christ. Christian, do you realize with Christ just how powerful you are? It's time to turn up. Paul's issuing a wake-up call to the church here. God is using Paul to prod the church and telling them to pump up the volume. Paul says, I hear your faith. Thank God for that. That's good, but it's time to turn up. He's praying that Christians, that they would have the eyes to see and the confidence of God in them, that they would be emboldened, that the flame in their collective heart would be fanned into a blaze. So even if you think your faith is at a 10, it's time to turn up to 11. <laughs> and yes, it goes to 11. <laughs> All right, let's go. So the Holy Spirit inspires Paul to pray that these Christians, that they would have the eyes of their hearts open to see their inheritance from God, which he says, verse 3, is every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Every spiritual blessing. And to perceive and comprehend the immeasurable power of God towards the believer so that they would know it. They would live in it. To remind us of what God has done in our own salvation. To remind us that God has called us to be his chosen through Christ. And in light of the grace of God, in light of all the work of God, God is calling for us to comprehend the revelation of Jesus Christ and to live into the Christian life. Uh, this is what the Ephesians, like all Christians, are struggling with. This is what we struggle with. The struggle to live into the Word of God. To not be conformed to the world in its ways. To not be discouraged in our failures. Because we will fail. To not be stamped out by our opposition. To not be overtaken again by our old ways and fall back into sin. Now, this is what Paul's driving at here. As one pastor says that there is a way... That you and I are meant to live the Christian life. As we who are, as Paul says in the scripture says, elect exiles, the adopted and chosen of God. Those who go, this is not our home. We find ourselves not at home in this world. We're not at home here. And we're living in a moment in history where our existence, it really does, by a growing number of people, look like an obstacle to progress. Our sexual ethic, an obstacle to progress. Our kind of external, moral, righteous beliefs, a hurdle to progress. So that by nature of our existence, we become a kind of problem to be solved. And so this is the exact thing that's happening to the churches in AD 54. They're not being arrested, not yet. They're not being thrown in prison and killed yet. But they are being increasingly marginalized in the culture, it's, it's getting increasingly hostile toward them. And we feel that a little bit. Like, I feel I am odder today than I was a decade ago. I am more, my beliefs are more misrepresented than they were 10 years ago. I feel like an understanding of who and what we believe is twisted and torqued and it is rolled out as something unrecognizable to me. Amen. Who loves Jesus and knows his word. And so how are we to live in this moment as God's elect exiles? 
as those chosen of God and adopted as his children. What is the wisdom and knowledge and hope and power that God or that God has led Paul to pray that we'll have the eyes of our hearts open to see and to understand? And that's what this passage is about. That's what Paul's laying out. We find ourselves in a world that is not our home. And we can feel that in increasing ways. And so in light of that, and in light of the fact that we're in this moment, by God's design, in light of that, how are we to live? How are we to find the wisdom and the strength and the power and the ability to do that? So how are we supposed to pull this off? Paul's praying that God will give you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation and the knowledge of him, knowledge of the hope to which he's called us and the immeasurable greatness of his power in us. It's not going to happen in your own strength. It's just not going to happen. My translation there in verse 19, it says his power toward us. Some translations that you're looking at say for us. But the word toward there in the Greek is the word eis, E-I-S. And it literally means in or into. All throughout the New Testament you see this word translated into. So Paul is praying that we'll have revelation to have the eyes of our hearts open to know the immeasurable greatness of God's power into us. In us. The power that he has put in us. And that word for power there is the Greek word dunamis. That's where we get our word dynamite. Now this is not some kind of subtle, slow moving, creeping power. And it's not just immeasurable. This is explosive power. And then the word working there in verse 19, where it says, according to the working of his great might. The word for working there is energia, from which we get our word energy. Which means that what God is working in you, the explosive work that he is working in you, he energizes by his great might. The work that he seeks to do through you, he will energize in you. Amen. And this power in us, verse 19 says, that by grace, God empowers and energizes us in the life to which we have been called. This is why you see those people that are so unstoppable for God. Like King David, who ran out to fight the giant Goliath. He says in Psalm 18, By you, Lord, I can run against a troop, and by my God, I can leap over a wall. And you look at those people and say, Wow, you know? Like that person is just special. You know, that person is just cut different. That person, they're just a different breed. Or maybe you think, you know, that's just their personality, or their confidence, or their lack of inhibition, or their ignorance, or their stupidity. I, I don't know. Just whatever it is that seems to be inherent in them. And I'm here to tell you, that's not just a product of their personality. It's not just a product of something inherent in them. It's a product of their faith. It's a product of grace. It's a product of the power of God at work in them and them having eyes open to see it and comprehend it to live into it, and to move in response to it. Amen. In faithfulness to the grace of God that's being poured out in them. That is power. But just what is this power? The spirit of wisdom and knowledge that God has put into us. You know, we started talking about this last week, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus told his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. But what is this power? Let's stop for a minute. Let's just let's talk about this. What is the purpose of all this? Just what is this wisdom and knowledge and power of God? What is this for? And if you are a Christian, and most of you in this room are, right? Amen. All right. You said, Jesus is my Lord. I give my life. I repent of my sin, and I put my faith in Christ alone. Well, as Matt Chandler explains it, he says, when you did that, the third person, the triune God of the universe, the spirit of the living God, he dwelt in you and was sealed in you in power. And that means, look at me, everybody, that means you are far more powerful than you think you are. Amen. 
You are more powerful than you think you are. Far more powerful than you can imagine. And I know one of the reasons that some of us were not living this out is we think that this stuff belongs to some kind of super Christian. And I want to tell you, there are no super Christians. There are just those filled with the Spirit of God who will step into it. And I'm not just talking about, when I talk about the Holy Spirit, I'm not just talking about charismatics. It frustrates me that people think we're talking about charismatics when we talk about the Holy Spirit. The ghost wasn't just given to Pentecostals, okay? He's given to the children of God. All of us in His body. He fills us all. All in all. He is all. Amen. In all. Come on. Like He dwells. You will receive power. You have received power. And now how is this tied to our witness? Because this is like, listen, I know some of you aren't going to believe me. And it's just a, it's a lack of discipleship. You are not stuck in your sins. Amen. You're not. Now you might be choosing to sit in them, but you're not stuck there. You have received power. Amen. You don't have to be addicted to pornography. You're choosing to sit there. You don't. Because the Spirit of God, He dwells inside you. And I'm not trying to shame you. Hear me. I'm not trying to shame you. Try to let you know there is power available to you. Amen. You're not stuck in your anxiety. You're talking to yourself. The Spirit of God dwells inside of you. You have received power. The same truth of the holiness and righteousness of the people of God being a plausibility structure in the ancient world and hold fast in this moment for you. You've been given the ghost. You can live a holy life. You've been given the ghost. You can walk in power. You've been given the ghost. You are welcome in the presence of Jesus. It's a discipleship issue. We've got to know you have received power. And that power, that makes you a witness. For the praise of God's glory, He has chosen you. <laughs> it just makes you a witness, guys. Like when we, when, when we by the power of the Holy Spirit... When we live lives that are pleasing to God, we become a really odd thing, yeah. what we are doing here. Which is why we are sometimes hated for it. And not because we're jerks, so long as we're not actually being jerks. Amen. <laughs> but because holy lives show the world that God is wise and that the world is foolish. And it's not always easy to obey Jesus. But it always is about you being led into the fullness of life. And you want to wage war against the creator of it all? It only leads to carnage. It leads only to carnage. And some of you guys are actually experiencing that carnage even now. But listen, I promise you. I promise you. All of these things that feel impossible to you are Him inviting you into the very life of Christ Himself. A life that He's giving you the power to live into. That you may live life, that you may have life to the full, and hopefully live holy and pursue holy lives. So what does it look like? In this environment, to live my life in such a way that men and women see our lives and see that we are different. Now, when I live my life in such a way that my only goal, ultimately, is to cultivate a heart that's fully alive for Him, to get into His presence and to stay there. Me and Chevy talk about this. All we really want to do is just live on fire for Jesus and stay in that place. When we're there, I mean, I just, in that place, I just flow patience. I flow power. I flow gratitude. I flow. I'm not working at it. It just it's, it bubbles up in me. And you're being welcomed into His presence to live in His power. And that power, it flows. And I'm telling you, I nail being a husband 
Well, I'm in the presence of Jesus. I'm the best dad ever if I'm in the presence of Jesus. I can see my money for what it is in the presence of Jesus, and I ain't afraid of nothing when I've been in the presence of Jesus. And if you realize the power that was in you, and what the presence of Jesus does, then so much of what we have to teach on and press on and to work on, it just vanishes. It just does, because you just know the Lord, and you're on fire for Him, and you live for Him. And people move to God who have eyes open to see the wisdom and knowledge and revelation of God. Who know the immeasurable greatness of His power. Who live like this. The more they see the Christian witness in God's Word, it stirs the forces of evil around us. And the more we see God move and we see God work, the more we recognize the resistance and the more encouraged we get. Like the apostles. What the apostles say? They said, we count it all joy. They counted it all joy, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus. Because they lived this. And they, lived it. they did it by the power of God. Paul himself said in 1 Corinthians 15, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. And Paul's praying here. He's praying here that we would understand. Have you ever thought about what Paul just said? Have you ever thought about it that Paul was concerned that the grace of God in him, that it could go in vain? He said, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me is not in vain. His grace wasn't in vain. Could his grace go in vain? You ever thought about that? That the grace of God toward you could be vanity, meaningless. A futile breath is what the word for vanity there means. Now Paul is praying here that Christians would have the eyes of our hearts enlightened that we would understand, that we would know. That God's power, it doesn't change. It's the eyes of our hearts that change. It's our knowing that changes. The knowledge to understand this divine, dynamic, explosive, eternal energy of God that's already at work in and around us. The power of this same God, the God who moved in Israel, the God who moved at Ephesus, the God who moved at the cross at Calvary, the God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that's the God who moves in our midst. That's the God who's working to move in and through you. And Paul is praying that the eyes of your hearts would be enlightened to see. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. Paul says, God's moving with the same power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. Christ is the head of the church, and we are the body of Christ. He is the head, we are the body, we are united together in him. And the power and the energy of the head that's what animates the body. God's already moving if you have eyes to see it. The question now is, are we going to be in step with the head? Are we going with him? Are we being driven by his power to follow his messages and his commands? He's sending to his body to go where he says to go, to do what he says to do. Are we ready to move? To see what the head is doing and are we willing so that you and I as his hands and feet that we will be animated to put one foot in front of the other and by his grace set in motion to carry out his will. Or are we instead operating in our own will? And are we operating in our own strength? But being in alignment with him, that's where the power is. Where we strive to do as He's commanded, He's provided the power for us there. 
As we've been seeing for the last few weeks in the cross and the resurrection, Christ, He's already defeated our enemy. He's already guaranteed our victory. The plan's already been written from before the foundation of the world. As one commentator says, our great God, He's already given us all that we need to live for Him. He's already given us eternal life. He's already given us His promise to secure that life, and He's already given us the power to conquer our sin. He's given us His Holy Spirit. He's given us the same power that raised Christ from the grave. So let's stop asking for what we already have. And let's start praying to understand and to see and to use what we've been given. The divine, dynamic, explosive, eternal energy of God at work in us and at work in our midst. God's already moving in power. If you have eyes to see it, you can see it. Every single week, I look around me and I see it. Last week I told you about Jared Richter, about God's work in him, about Mercedes and Scott Thrash and Brittany and Bella. Sydney Allen was baptized Easter Sunday too. Next week, as Chevy said, we've got another baptism service coming up where some people who didn't get baptized in Easter, they're going to be baptized there. I'm excited to see. And this week, Jared Richter, he's not with us today. Because this week, after a year of our relentless prayer and the help of some of our brothers and sisters here within this room, Jared is back on his feet and he's working again. Amen. He's off on a tugboat, doing his new job, a good job. And to top it all off, the absolute best part of all of that, his dad, whom he had had a falling out with and had been estranged from for a long time, actually drove him to his first day of work. Yeah, that's God's work in reconciliation. That's a God who's moving. That's a God of restoration. That's power. Amen. This past week, I ate breakfast with another member of our congregation. I like to try to eat with John at least a couple times a month. But when I met him, John had, had a tumor in his chest so big that it nearly choked him to death. They had to call the ambulance just to keep him breathing, and they found that tumor in the ER. After that, he gave his life to Christ. He was baptized. Since then, he is a different man. He's a kind and compassionate man. A more understanding man. And we joke, me and him, about how his little grandson has named him Happy. And he laughs because he says that is the absolute least fitting, most ironic name that he feels that anyone could have ever given him. I have watched God literally melt this man. He is... Tough as nails. But now he is a whole lot softer and a whole lot more loving than here. That's my guy and that's my God. Sat with a woman who I've watched cry as she told me that she had been praying for her husband fasting every single Monday without fail for 30 years. Without fail. 30 years. Praying that her husband would come to Christ. And he did. Amen. And now he is living in faith with the power of Christ in him. That is expected faith. That is a God who answers prayer and who moves, and that is power. Amen. And so today, I urge you to hear the word of the Lord and believe with me that God does amazing things. Amen. I'm living in faith in the power of God. Come on. We can give it up for God. I can take time for that. Probably the best thing we could do. In living in faith in the power of God, when we live together with eyes open to see what God is doing, when we behold it, when we begin to more clearly perceive all these things that God is doing in and around us all the time, that gives God glory. That stokes our faith. That creates in us a burning fire that knows. How could we not believe? How could we not trust the power of God in us? How could we not go? That's the God I see. The God I've seen. That's the God that I expect to show up. 
When he's on the move, he never gets discouraged. He never says, this problem is too difficult and I don't know what to do. But he makes a way where a way formerly seemed impossible and he calls us to believe and to follow after him in his power. Now the question isn't whether or not God is working. It is not. It's not whether or not he's able because he is. Or even whether or not he's given us everything that we need because he has. It's always whether or not we have eyes open to see his work and to comprehend all the resources that he's extended to us. And whether or not we will step up, lay down what we're doing, and be faithful and join him in what he is doing. But God is never not moving. And we have the power of God at work in and around us. And he's given us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him and put the immeasurable greatness of his power to work in us. For the very purpose, so that I pray, this is my prayer, we've been reading Paul's prayer, my prayer, that we'll respond as the early Christians did, in joy and excitement and hope and courage and confidence and motivation and perseverance and gratitude and power and faithfulness and in belief. Belief in the power of God. That we will live like these early Christians did. Holy lives. On fire for Jesus. Confidently and boldly in the hope and riches and power that are yours in Christ. And in being united with Him. That we'd have eyes to see. So that we'd stop looking around. Concerned for everything going on out there. And going on around us. And I pray, Lord, would you set your people on fire so that instead of us looking out there, the eyes of the world would be drawn to us so they could watch us burn. Amen.